for Jason Kidd and the New Jersey Nets. Does the Lakers' three-peat signal a new basketball dynasty? And it's a new era in tennis. Just like Dad predicted, sisters Serena and Venus Williams are number one and number two in the world. The surprise? Cat-suited younger sister Serena holds the top spot. Lucrative endorsements follow. There it is, as grand as it gets. A growing issue for many in sports. Should Tiger Woods play in the Masters Championship at the Augusta National Golf Club? The club's practice of excluding women has caused high-profile members to resign. Should Tiger join the protest? Folks, a stellar lineup indeed. We will get to them. Tommy Davidson hosted a party where Emmett Smith broke the record. We got Robert Wall, Charles Barkley, Daryl Green, a living legend, the comedian George Wallace, and a man who does at least 58 stories a day on Pardon the Interruption and 18 other jobs he has, Michael Wilbon. Story of the year in sports for you. Well, JB, all those faces we saw represent great stories. We're mm -hmm. talking about Venus and Serena Williams. And there's some other stories up there. Barry Bonds, Lance Armstrong. There, there are a lot of great stories. The one that is my favorite uh, reflects sort of the human drama of athletic competition, and it's Juan Dixon leading the University of Maryland to a basketball championship despite the fact that when he was 14 and 15 years old, he lost his mother and father mm -hmm. to AIDS. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this young man with his brother, Philip, helping uh, to raise him, goes to college, uh, is there when Steve Francis is at the University of Maryland. People are saying, well, what are you here? What are you here for? Are you going to back up Steve Francis at Maryland? He does that. He stays. He stays for four years. He gets a college degree. He leads his team to a championship. He's drafted in the first round. I don't know a, a more storybook story and ending. If it stopped right now, it'd be a great story. And he's not because he's playing in the league and he's playing well. Speaking of book, Charles Barkley uh, with Michael Wilbon has written a book. Uh, I may be wrong, but I doubt it. Mm -hmm. Charles <laughs> is via satellite with Robert Wool, who I'm sure would like to represent some of these athletes. Charles, your thoughts first <laughs> and then Robert. Well, I think as a, as a black man right now with Tiger and Serena and Venus Williams, this is probably the, like the golden time for us to donate sports that have always excluded blacks. I just think it's so cool for Tiger to be out there kicking butt and Venus and Serena to be out there kicking butt, you know, because they were excluded from these sports for a long time. And I just think those are two of the big stories, and uh, God bless all three of them. Robert Wall? Um, uh, well, one of the biggest stories broke today with uh, Bob Johnson of BET mm -hmm. becoming the first black owner of a major a major team with the uh, Charlotte uh, expansion team. Mm -hmm. Although I told the Charles, I said, wouldn't it be funny if he had a draft like a big white European or a Chinese guy? Or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, but I think because I mean, what do you do then? Uh, but I, there's two stories that stuck out for me as far as I mean, it, Will Bond's story is the best human interest story. Mm -hmm. But two stories stuck out to me about. The, the nature of sports today. One was the all-star game ending in a tie, which to me showed utter disdain for the fans. Mm. Totally, we're going to play this until we're tired and you can go home. And then the other one is the cheating scandal of the Olympic skaters. These mm. are two stories that, to me, were bigger than the sport itself. It mm. transcended. Robert Wall, a.k.a. R, was upset about it. Didn't he? Mm. Oh, there's one other one. Okay, go there's ahead. one other one. The cancellation of HBO's show, Arliss. <laughs> well, let me turn to your comedian buddy, My Tommy God. Davidson. Go ahead. I feel that same way about it living color, man. I'll tell you that right there. This, for, for, for this year, the big stories, I'm not surprised. Now, wait a minute, Tommy. Are you speaking as a black man, as Charles Barkley was saying, are you speaking of what else? Well, I'm getting a lighter as we speak. Uh, actually, you know, I'm not surprised about the big stories about the athletes, because we've always known the African-American athletes athletes excel once they're given an opportunity. So Serena and her sister, they don't surprise me. Michael Vick, given the opportunity mm -hmm. this year, doing what he does, mm -hmm. doesn't surprise me. Cornelius Green was a quarterback years back that didn't have mm -hmm. a chance to compete as a, as, a, as a pro quarterback. And a lot of them, Charlie Ward was a quarterback that came out, and black quarterbacks don't get an opportunity to compete. Sean King is a quality quarterback who I don't think has had a chance to mm -hmm. show his stuff. So that doesn't surprise me. I think, I think the big sports story to me this year is Charles Barkley. Charles yeah. Barkley. Oh, yeah, because so? we, we have, Charles has done so well in what he's been doing that we even forgot that he played. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. I mean, the, here's an athlete that went from spitting on people to spitting knowledge. <laughs> you know? I mean, this <laughs> I mean, and now he's got a forum, oh, he's got a book, goodness. and he's right? saying things that make sense. He's, 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 you know, and if you, if you have been here with us me. earlier, you can tell he's gone down from 335 to about 255. Oh, yeah. He changed hey, on hey, camera hey, for Tommy. 
<laughs> hey, Tommy, you know the bad thing about getting on television and telling the truth? What's that? It's just a matter of time before they cancel my black ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sure sure gonna 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 Didn't he play bad? Did Come on. Well, yeah, yeah, did you write this book? Hey, it's did just you? a matter of time because nobody wants to ever hear the truth. <laughs> We're supposed to just make them a lot of money and shut the hell up. We right. don't know my days are numbered. We're supposed to get it all Might out. Might as well get it all out now. We right? will clean this up and go to the Reverend, the right Reverend, oh, Daryl Green, 20 years in the hey. National Football League. And folks, he is just as fast today as he was 20 years ago. That's not being freaked. That's being blessed. If nothing Your story. else in my mind, I am. And that, and that matters, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, Venus and Serena because, I mean, these are two, not only African Americans, but they're women. Mm -hmm. And not too often in our history have women been recognized where they have, when they played in all these championships, the crowd was still there. They still had the prime time. So I, I just think that they really take us, really almost as a human race, to a different level. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very proud of that, that accomplishment. Let me get the final 30 seconds of this segment to uh, George Wallace. And I'll do it in 20 seconds. Everybody else is talking about everybody else. My favorite sports uh, story of the year was Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson. I thought that was some. I mean, I never saw anybody whoop like that before. <laughs> I mean, Rodney King called him and said that was close. <laughs> Lennox Lewis whooped his ass, man. And, was, and Mike, Mike Tyson said, I'm going to go home and play with my birds. You know when he was laying on the table? He actually think he owned those birds that he saw. <laughs> Hey, folks, with that in mind, we'll take some bird breaks. We'll take some bird breaks. We'll be back in a month. We're back. It's Black History 2002 Year in Review. I'm Juan Williams. It's now time to look at the top political stories of the year. Our man at the heart of American politics is NAACP chairman and political commentator Julian Bond. He says 2002 was a historic year in politics where several controversial figures left the stage. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. The president got off to a shaky start with his controversial axis of evil State of the Union address. But by midterm elections, he had a GOP landslide. It was the most impressive midterm game for the president's party in half a century sealing Republican control of Congress with majorities in both the House and the Senate. You had no idea what the Democratic Party stood for. The uh, Democratic Party has, uh, in my judgment, began to see uh, reaping a decade or more of trying to imitate Republicans. President George W. Bush used his popularity nationwide to gain record support by African Americans. Critics said both the Democratic Party and black voters ended up missing in action. The frustrations of both liberal African-American leaders and Democrats boiled over when singer Harry Belafonte called Colin Powell and Uncle Tom. This was never meant to be a personal attack on Colin Powell's character. What it was meant, however, to be was an attack on policy. And here's our vote for the most controversial statement of the year. When Strom Thurmond ran for president, we voted for him. We're proud of it. And if the rest of the country had followed our lead, we wouldn't have had all these problems over all these years either. George Stephanopoulos, when you think about the top political stories of 2002, what comes to mind? Oh, well, this is sort of like the Oscars this year. You know, they put all the big <laughs> movies out at the very end of the year. All the big political stories happened at the end of, of 2002. President Bush's huge triumph in the November elections. And then just this last week, um, the Trent Lott controversy, huge political story, and Al Gore. Uh, dropping out of the 2004 race. Think about it. Just two years ago, he won the popular vote, won more votes than any Democrat in history, and now he has to get out of the race because George Bush is so strong. Jerry Fowler, what would you identify as your political story of 2002? Well, I'm right with George Stephanopoulos. There's no way to deny that uh, this November 5th was, uh, in my lifetime, uh, I know something happened around the early 50s, but it uh, nothing has been so novel, so spectacular uh, as what Mr. Bush was able to do in, in outfoxing all of his opponents. I, I, of course, the uh, the comments, the dropout of Mr. Uh, Gore and, and uh, Trent Lott's uh, comments, all these things have been year-end punches in the belly, depending on where you're standing. But uh, the victory November 5th is something I have to be, uh, be, be honest about. I didn't expect it. Uh, we were all talking big, and I being one of Mr. Bush's supporters, 
but I have to be honest and say that I would have, uh, I, I did not expect the Senate victory. For the first time in my life, and I hope it's the last time, I'm going to agree with Jerry Falwell. I think it was the Republican <laughs> hush, sweep. Hush, hush, hush. Because <laughs> not only was it a great, great victory for President Bush and the Republican Party, it showed real weaknesses in the Democratic Party, and that's not healthy for anybody in the country, particularly for African Americans who've been so loyal to this party for years to come. So that's the big, big story. Oh, Julian, because tell it me what the weaknesses are that you're referring to. The weaknesses are the failure of the party to have a message, the failure of the party to turn out its base, the failure of the party to stand for something. You know, when the shameless and the spineless run against each other, the shameless are going to win every time. Well, it sounds like you think it's bad news for the year to come as well. Oh, of course it is, because some people who represent the worst elements in American politics now have control of the levers of power. And it really doesn't matter what happens to Trent Lott, because he's likely to be replaced with somebody whose politics are just like his. Andy? Trent Lott may be the story of next year. I'm not sure the story of this one man right. um, is, is a story. Right. I mean, it's a great story for us to cover. But if, right. if the fallout is that Trent Lott resigns and we get a Democrat in there, you've got a 50-50 Senate. That changes everything. If the fallout is that people take a look at the racial divide uh, in a much more serious way right. and look at the subtleties of it, that's a huge story. But it right. hadn't happened yet. It's going to be the fallout from yeah. Trent Lott, and that'll be next year. Right, but, that's, but the fact that he's gotten so much trouble for a comment he's made at least twice in the past shows how much the Republican Party, or at least the Republican Party, wants to change. I mean, the fact that there was such an outcry inside the Republican Party shows that it's a real end to an era that probably began with Barry Goldwater in 1964, ran right through the eras of Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond, the Lee Atwater campaigns of 1988. Those days are over. You know, I think, I think the, uh, it is a really an important moment for the Republican Party. I think President Bush, when he did not get the kind of black support that he felt he would, should have gotten in 2000, he was really disappointed. It was widely known all throughout the White House. If for no other reason, we've got to show blacks that we want to earn their respect, earn their trust, and earn their likability. Reverend Paula, what's the long-term consequence of the lot controversy? Uh, I, I, there's no way uh, but to condemn the statement. But I think we have to also, and the media has to take a little lesson from this, we have to, be, we have to get rid of the double standard. Uh, Senator Byrd in, in West Virginia, his use of the N-word and referring to some white people he didn't like, and Jesse Jackson's uh, Jaime Town for New York, and, and you could mention you know, uh, dozens of such statements. Reverend Falwell, are you suggesting that he should lose his leadership position? How do you feel about that? What's your position on it? Well, uh, as much as I love him and appreciate him, I'd have to vote in that direction because I think that the future total good uh, for the Republican Party and Mr. Bush, who is leading in wartime now, is that we've got to send a signal to all 280 million Americans, everybody's equal, all right. everybody's uh, loved equal. So, Julian, here we have Reverend Falwell saying that Trent Lott should not remain in his leadership post. A surprise to you? Uh, a happy surprise. I'm glad to hear it. What this incident does, and it may or may not carry over to next year, is it exposes the dirty little secret of the Republican Party. And that secret is they've been unwilling to cut themselves away from this tiny, tiny right-wing white supremacist base that is excited by appeals to the Confederate past, excited about putting down interracial marriage, excited about waving the Confederate flag. They've been unwilling to cut themselves away from this. Now, dumping Trent Lott doesn't do that if they prop up in his place somebody who's smoother, more sophisticated, just like him. So this could be an important moment for the Republican Party, or it could and be just Julian. business as usual. You know, it's easy to talk about what goes on in the Democratic Party and their subtle racism. Look, this problem with Trent Lott was a problem in our party. It was a problem in our house. I'm not interested in a focus on what somebody else did in their house. It was a cancer that was growing, and it was our responsibility. Our principles, our values, and our dignity was on the line. And we had to cut it out and get rid of it, as you do with any disease. Final word for George Stephanopoulos on this story. I would say watch three things next year on policy to really see if this made any difference. Will Judge Charles Pickering be renominated? Re what will the administration do? Will they support uh, an end to affirmative action at the University of Michigan file a Supreme Court brief? And how will they handle welfare reform? Those are going to be the issues that determine whether this has a long-term impact. All right. We'll have more when we come right back. Welcome back to the show. It's Black History 2002 Year in Review. I'm Juan Williams. What was the story of the year? Let's take a look at the nominees.
our homicide rate just increased by 25% in one day. Of all the stories of 2002, the one that tapped our deepest fears was the killing spree by two men, John Allen Muhammad and John Lee Malvo. Their three-week rampage baffled law enforcement and the media. Strangely, one of the biggest surprises, they were black. This is unlike anything we've ever seen. For the Bush administration, public enemy number one was Saddam Hussein. After war threats and UN weapons inspections, the biggest question for Americans, war or peace? We're not afraid of war if we must fight war. There are some, there are some necessary wars. We're not naive. A less visible yet important story, corporate crime. 2002 saw white-collar corporate rogues caught wheeling, dealing, and stealing America blind. The American economy faltered. Ironically, this was the year powerful black CEOs were celebrated for the first time. Ken Chenault of American Express, Richard Parsons of AOL Time Warner, and Stanley O'Neill of Merrill Lynch made the cover of Newsweek magazine. And 2002 saw the reopening of the New York City Central Park jogger case. It was a symbol of urban violence out of control. The rape of the New York City jogger introduced the slang term wilding and led to major reform in law enforcement. But new DNA evidence and confession cast serious doubt on the guilty verdicts. All five men convicted have been released, sparking debate on race and justice in America. Those are the nominees for Story of the Year. Deborah Mathis, what's your pick? Uh, none of the above, actually, and, and at the same time, kind of a uh, uh, summary of all of those stories. It is terrorism, period, mm. pure and simple. Whether it be foreign or domestic, black or white, local or national or internationally, terrorism it has to be the story of the year because it has gripped us all, continues to day by day, and it's changed the world. So you call the sniper, as well as Saddam Hussein, as well as what's going on in Afghanistan, all of it terror. Yes. Just come, become part of our lives in the year 2002. Unfortunately, it has, and I think 2002 has been one of the most difficult years of the modern era. Charles right. Barkley, what would you say has the, been the story of the year? Well, I'd have to go back to the snipers. Uh, that was obviously, other than 9-11, probably the most tragic things. That little spree, that little weak spree, uh, was the tr most tragic thing that probably ever happened when you kill innocent people. That is, she's right, that is terrorism. And I'm, I'm not going to deny it. I had a great argument with some of my black friends. Man, I was crushed when, they, when I found out those guys were black. Um, for some reason, I feel like we as blacks, we get treated differently when we commit crimes. And when we do things, it's a reflection on our entire community. And I was just crushed when I found out they were black. Armstrong? Uh, the dirty little secret of the church I mean, mm -hmm. it was a Catholic church, we talked about it, but there's just so many other churches, how um, we still have to deal with human behavior and the challenges of being mor moral. And I think the, ch the Catholic church especially have to rethink their, their stance on celibacy and priests. I mean, you've got to uh, understand that it's important to have family. And I don't see anything that's written in the doctrine of the Bible that says a man has to be celibate in order to go into the priesthood or to serve God. I think it's healthy when a man has a family to reinforce him and to strengthen them. I think when you don't have this, you, you just rid yourself of some of the best priests and men of God that will come in and you get the kind of element that you have in the church now. Arthel, you, you also are in the business of looking at stories every day on Talk Back Live. So what was your pick? You're, you're a pro here. Which is actually precisely why I can't say there's one story. I agree with Deborah mm. that there is a, a potpourri of stories. I mean, the Catholic Church, and you're right, it's not just the Catholic Church. I mean, what a travesty there. Mm. Uh, the t war on terrorism, and Charles is right that it's it, it, the sniper story, I mean, that was a story that had no boundaries. Race, religion, mm -hmm. age, anyone could have been a victim at any given moment. And then, honestly... The surprise ending of that story, the fact that they were black, I mean, you felt, it's very odd, you felt some responsible in some odd way, mm. you know, it's like, wait a minute, we don't right. do those types of things, right. we're being misrepresented here. Well, you know, George, you can hear it in the room, people were hurt by the idea that these two men, killing people, killing black people, injuring black people, as well as white people, 
And even, when we found out they were black, I mean, this was a time when even white people were saying, that's a white person doing this. That's we don't, right. we don't yeah, do really. this, you know? And, and to me, it Charles brought up and you brought up the, the sniper case, and I mean, I'm glad it's over. That shocked me more. Black crime this year was crazy. I mean, we started with the crematory down in Georgia. Then we had the lady in Houston, the black lady in Houston, ran over the man and kept him in the garage for three days and checked oh, on him. Yes. Said that she thought, you know, on the windshield, she thought it was raining men and right. stuff like that. <laughs> and then you had the snipers here. I was in, I, I came to D.C. even when that sniper was out. I swear to God, I ran out of gas. I sat in the car for three days. I ain't lying, Charles. <laughs> I called AAA. He wouldn't get out of the car. We both sat there for three days. And they, now they want to know, should we try this young man as an adult? Anytime you cannot be a member of the Cub Scout, you're old enough to be, if you don't and have to shoot, you're old enough to be shot. That's right. To kill people, you can be then killed. You be Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Let me let me All let me right. go around the room on that. Charles Barkley, would you say that that young man and the the adult should get the death penalty? They should have been dead by now already. Talk to me, somebody. Right. Deborah. I, I mean, I don't. I'm, buy, a big I'm sorry. I, you know what? If I could do this, and I tried to explain this to my children one time, they said, Mama, when they were little, Mama, don't you think, you mean if someone did this to us, you wouldn't want to kill them? I said, want to do it with my bare hands and tear them apart, and I would be wrong. All right. I don't believe in the death penalty. When we return, James Brown has the top stories in entertainment. Hey folks, we are back. It is Black History 2002 Year in Review, and we are here with the top entertainment stories. We start with television, the hits, and the misses. Top-rated African-American shows for the year included The Bernie Mac Show and Cedric the Entertainer Presents. Yet TV's most fascinating moments were unscripted. X-rated home video put R. Kelly in jail. Whitney Houston had her ups and downs. And then there was Michael Jackson. People you know, me and Tim Lamb in high 20 years ago. R&B singer Alicia Keys was queen at the Grammys, but hip-hop owned the mic. Eminem was Rolling Stone magazine's artist of the year with the hit album and the movie 8 Mile. Jay-Z was the vibe artist of the year. The sad flip side of rap was also apparent. Jam Master J of legendary Run DMC was gunned down. One of the pioneers is out now, and I hope they find whoever it is. Halle Berry cried in surprise as the first black woman to win the Best Actress in Oscar history. Denzel Washington won Best Actor, and if Halle Berry wanted to cool down her image, she succeeded. And this summer featured multicultural action heroes. But the talk of the season was barbershop. It started a debate. Are some topics too serious for laughs? Well, you know what? We go from uh, one comedian to another. Tommy Davidson, your thoughts about the, the misses this year and or the hits? Well, um, uh, I think R. Kelly was the, well, like the biggest story in entertainment this year. You know, unfortunate, you know, incident that happened that went, he went from being the top, top, top entertainer in music to wondering what's going to happen to his life. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that was the top. But he one went right to the top and as a as a porn star though. So <laughs> no. now George said that. George so said that. Okay. To, uh, get that clip. We got uh, that no. clip. <laughs> and um, barbershop, of course, with, with Cedric said what he said, which and, and which caused a lot of controversy. The movie made a lot of money. It's a very funny movie. But I, I, my personal opinion is is that if we would have said something like that about a Jewish leader, or he would have said the same thing about John F. Kennedy Jr. would would they still think that that is cute? Would the movie industry think that oh, it's nothing? It's just a joke. Mm -hmm. you know? but isn't, that the, isn't, isn't that the point though that that we should be able to kind of own our our own people and our own opinions and be able to kind of speak out? I mean, oh, that's yeah. one of the problems we have right. is is we can't speak that freely right, right. now. So anytime we say right. anything that's controversial, right. everybody, you know, I could say I don't like cheese, and then somebody get on the page. Then why not you should gotta right. talk about black people and cheese? All of a sudden, all black people right. don't like cheese. You know, right. couldn't just be the things that I felt <laughs> and I said right. it. Why well, gotta be about all of us all the right. damn time, you know? Right. But I'm saying, you know, the new, the movie industry are the ones that, that, that green light lines like that coming out of our mouths. But would they green light those same kind of lines about mm -hmm. themselves? Mm -hmm. That's all. But Tommy, but, I, you know what I wonder mm -hmm. about? I wonder if that was, how much that was ad-libbed, how much was scripted. I'd like to know more about that exchange. Because just as, as somebody who deals with opinions every day, who writes a column, I love seeing the exchange. If it, the exchange about Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, were one-sided right. exchanges, I would have been really upset. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. thought they tried to bring, and I, therefore I thought it scripted. Right. 
But if it wasn't, it was a hell of an ad lib job. But I like, like Aisha said, I like the fact that you saw 360 degrees and people brought all kinds of opinions mm -hmm. to that moment. And the bottom and line is, how go. often do we see that yeah. happening in right. barbershops right. real life? Let me, go right. to, hey, let me go to Robert Wall. Hey, Robert, like let me that. get your thoughts from your perspective. How did you react to it, Robert? Well, first of all, I like cheese. We all like that. You know. You got me. You might find you might find this hard to believe. You might find this hard to believe, but I haven't been in one of those barber shops in a while. <laughs> um, so I have not seen the picture. I gotta say, I haven't seen it. But I, just the fact that we're talking about it is great. I have to believe it was written. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was mm -hmm. written, and uh, and I mean the whole movie uh, was it was written and directed by African Americans, wasn't it? Right. Ice Cube. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, yeah. So I mean, produced, you know, so about. I mean, I think it's great. I mean, and you know, Jews. I mean, Mel Brooks has got a. Uh, uh, He's been making fun of Hitler and the Holocaust, and uh, you know, yeah. for a long time. So okay. I, I think that's okay. I think yeah, also, I mean, um, I, for me, the biggest stories were Holly Berry's a big story. I mm -hmm. mean, that was a, I mean, that, that a breakthrough there. As far as um, in another ethnic way, I mean, talk about the movies. Uh, this little uh, movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, that cost four million dollars, five million dollars to make, and has made two hundred and fifty million dollars mm -hmm. because I think it transcends every ethnic group's family. Loud and clear. Let me bring right. Arthel Neville into this conversation. Arthel. Uh, first of all, I have to say that the barbershop. Uh, I thought if you, you it's taken out of context. First of all, mm -hmm. you know the whole uh, Cedric's uh, line about Rosa Parks and uh, Martin Luther King. The thing is that that movie has so many positive messages mm -hmm. uh, and a credit to Ice Cube. And I think that it's a shame. Actually, 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 it's not a shame. You know why? Because it got a lot of seats in the theater. Mm -hmm. So that was actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of comedic uh, license, George? Well, I, I'm going to go with the story. Like, I got two. First of all, I want to do uh, uh, Whitney Houston. I, and because I'm still amazed by, you know, getting the receipts from the drugs. And I didn't know that happened. I don't do drugs. <laughs> I didn't know they gave receipts. <laughs> I, that's pretty good. I didn't know they gave receipts. I, I didn't know that. But, but, oh, yeah, oh, they didn't yeah, give back a whole lot of receipts. They took American Express out here. They took the gold card out here. And then Michael Jackson. Jackson, out. And Michael Jackson dangling the white baby over there. And the baby was not as white as Michael, though. Oh, but we're talking to... But we couldn't wait, tell wait, 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 wait. We're talking... This is the black form, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that's sorry. a different show. Okay. Uh, Aisha, go ahead. You want to jump in on this one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I think that kind of the barbershop thing ties into that I think was a big story overall this year was, like, the diversity of the black voice. Because that was just about us being able to express a variety of opinions, mm -hmm. you know, in the context of our own space. The barbershop was supposed to be about feeling free to speak, you know, how you really feel without fear of being censored. And I think what we've proven with, like, the R. Kelly story and the Whitney Houston story and Michael Jackson dangling the white baby over the, uh, the balcony is that we're finally, now, in 2002, just as crazy as white people. We have finally come uh, hey, to that place. But you can believe just that. as crazy you can as white at, folks. You can look at what happened this year, starting with the crematory down in Georgia. Now, uh, white people knew that was a white man. And, and, well, George, <laughs> George, George. and when you found out the sna snipers the are sniper? black, mm -hmm. oh, oh, you, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, everybody that I can know, every time. Hold on, hold on, Robert, go ahead, Robert. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to. Go ahead. Let me hear this. Well, but, you know, I, I just every that, time I just think that she's talking to. No, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, no, I just think that, you know, I, I love Cedric. I love the fact that that movie made some money. But let me tell you something, man. When you say something about a black lady, like, F that person, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, hey, man, there's a lot that took place for us to be able to even do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's you true. Know? I think they fought for the right for us to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I know yeah. any barbershop I went in, believe me, it's a long time. So, so, we'll go, so, so, so we'll go and have our leaders fight for our freedom, and then we'll go to have the freedom when to you say, fight for our leaders. freedom, it is, it is for freedom. It is not for right. being bombed. Final 10 seconds. Eminem dominating hip-hop. Okay with you? Hey, three trailer park girls go around the outside, round the outside. With that in mind, when we come back, the challenge for black America in 2003 and beyond. <laughs> We're back to looking back. It's Black History 2002 Year in Review. As we embark on a new year, what are some of the challenges for African Americans? Political commentator Deborah Mathis reports. Will the major challenge for African Americans be to end disparities in health care? African Americans die at twice the rate of whites in all major disease categories. AIDS is truly an epidemic out of control in America's black community and in sub-Saharan Africa. Will economic challenges be at the top of the list for the black community? 
The year's economic downturn increased joblessness for blacks, and according to Black Enterprise magazine, there is a widening gap between rich and poor and black and white in America. Or will civil rights continue to be the most important challenge for black America? 2002 witnessed deliberations at the Supreme Court in a case that may end affirmative action as we know it. 2002 also marked the 10-year anniversary of the Los Angeles riots. Have the wounds healed? It seemed America has not yet forgotten its past legacy of racial segregation. Trent Lott's reference to Strom Thurmond's 1948 presidential run on the segregation platform raised the question, has the nation overcome the shadow of its racist past? But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's not enough troops in the army to force the southern people to break down segregation and admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. Julian Bond, this is a struggle that you've been in touch with throughout your whole life. As you look now and try to understand challenges headed in the year to come, 2003 and beyond, what do you see for African Americans? You know, Juan, times changes, seasons change, presidents change, political parties change, but issues remain the same. Du Bois said over a hundred years ago that the problem of the last century would be the problem of the color line. He could easily say that again today. Mm. Race is the big dividing factor in American public life. We're reminded about it almost every day, and sad to say, it's going to be the factor in the year to come. George Wiles, what do you see? Well, I would like to see education because I think this is the number one uh, door knocker. If we had 75% uh, of the kids going to college, that would really help because the more education, the more you can live. You can live life really, really good. The more I'd like to see more education. Aisha Tyler, what do you see? Coming down the I'm going to agree with, with George. And I think education is incredibly important right now because, I mean, let's face it, right now, our culture is pop culture, and that's hip hop. Mm -hmm. And the images and the words that are being put out there in the hip-hop culture are not about education. They're not about uplifting. They're not about enlightening. And none of the, you know, none of those aspects that I came up with that were in the 50s about education is the way up. Education is the way out. That's been replaced by, you know, shake your booty in a video, get a guy to take you out, get a guy to buy you a car, you know, get a hot girl to make you look like you're a man. I thought, what would you say, picking up on that thing? Hmm. I, I actually agree with what Aisha is saying in terms of the presentation. There's certainly nothing wrong with having color, literally and figuratively. But again, it's the presentation, and you have to realize that you're right. The kids are looking up to these, uh, these, these hip hoppers as role models, regardless if they want to have that uh, role or not. That's, in fact, what they are. But I also want to go to health care, because I think it's a shame that every Ooh. person in this country, in America, does not have access to proper yeah. health care. I mean, every time I have to go to the doctor and I can go and pay my little $10 or whatever, I say, thank God for health care. And I really am bothered by the fact that I see so many, especially in the black community, because it also ties into the joblessness. Mm -hmm. Without a job, without benefits, you don't have access to health care. So those are some of the things that I would like to see get better. Armstrong, let's see where you, what you see, what you perceive when you look into the crystal ball for the year to come. Well, I, you know, I, I just think that, yes, racism will always be among us, but I just mm -hmm. think we make too much out of race. I think it's very dangerous that we have created sort of a group mentality among black people, whether it's racial profiling. If it's black, if it happens to somebody that looks like me, then it can happen to me too. I think that is very dangerous. We need to identify by our value system. We may have experiences where they grouped us together according to the hue of our skin, but we don't have to continue that mentality in this millennium that we're in. Mm -hmm. But, but this, this is the same perfect time, setup. This is the perfect setup because I'm going to say just the opposite as I usually do from what Armstrong says. I believe that what we lack in our community is the old, the old activism. We talk about how the hip-hop generation may be sending some of the wrong messages, although we have to give them credit. They're also doing a wonderful job in some of their poetry and expressing themselves. But it's time for the grown-ups to take over again. And if we're going to do that, we need to be active. We have to realize it's not just when a Trent Lott comes out and says something like he said, that we need to get active. Every day, policy and law are being made that are affecting our children, our mm -hmm. unborn children, and reaching into posterity. So then if Deborah, that's not enough to get us going, I, I think we ought to fight more then battles. Deborah, knowing all that, though, how do we get us to the polls? 
Well, you know, well, that's, that's, that's first a good of all, it's start. not just a poll. That's a good start. Yeah. Give Charles a chance. First of all, I don't think it's just a poll either. I think that if you look, one of the things I said in the book was, we as black people, we don't treat each other well mm -hmm. until we address. We got to start waiting. First of all, I agree with Armstrong. We can't blame white people for everything that's wrong in our community. We can blame until them for we address no, three basic oh, problems. Yeah. Oh, no, you can't. Black oh, yeah. on black Not crime, in this day and time. teenage pregnancies, mm -hmm. and single parent homes. Mm -hmm. Until we address those three problems, we are never going to be successful. Which comes around to everything I was saying. If everybody get educated, then we'd be in a better place because I don't know what they're teaching the new kids these days. I went to McDonald's the other day. My total was two dollars and seventy eight cents. I gave the kid three dollars and three pennies and all hell broke loose. Wow. <laughs> all right. All right. Two we'll different continue kinds of this education. discussion. <laughs> and you can tell us in ten. We'll continue time. when we return. And then there's Well, that's our show. I'm Juan Williams. And I'm James Brown. And from all of us to all of you, thank you so much, and we'll see you again soon. This program has been brought to you by AT&T.